once again dug up from the remarkable cemetery at Ur in Mesopotamia, we have an example of Sumerian art that is absolutely unique, arresting and unusually revealing of the culture which produced it. This piece, Ram Caught in a Thicket, speaks to us of the riches of Ur in its visual complexity. The animal represents the religious impulses and most basic beliefs and ideas of an early urban culture. It also emphasizes the ties that bind humans to animals. Two unusual and colorful statues of rearing goats are now amongst the greatest and oldest treasures in world museums. They're almost identical. One is in the British Museum, the other in University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. They date to about 2550 BC and are approximately 45 centimeters high. In the previous lecture, we looked at the wonderful, colorful rendition of actions and rites taking place in the ancient city of Ur, shown on the standard of Ur. We saw a ruler and his army waging war, and that same ruler banqueting and receiving bounty from the land on the other side. That object told its story in a two-dimensional and narrative mode. In this lecture, we'll look at an ancient masterpiece that is represented in three-dimensional sculpture from the same place. It is also colorful and consists of many similar precious materials. Let's look closer. Sir Leonard Woolley, while excavating the Great Death Pit at the ancient Mesopotamian site of Ur, found two sculptural figures, one broken and the other flattened and crushed beneath the soil of the tomb. Their outline, however, was clear, and it made it possible to reconstruct them provided they were carefully removed. This was true of many of the objects found in the Royal Cemetery. As you can see here, the state of these excavated objects was similar to that of a queen and attendants richly garbed in gold headdresses and jewelry, whose crushed skulls were also found in the death pit. The sacrifice of so many attendants in numerous Ur burials struck a chord in the press of the time. The press had a somewhat lurid interest, which resulted in many stories and reconstructions of the events surrounding the burials. Let me tell you a little bit more about the place in which these objects were excavated. It tells us a lot about their purpose and the society which created them. The Great Death Pit, where these goat sculptures were found, contained the bodies of 73 attendants alone. It seems they were put to death to accompany their ruler or priest to the underworld. Woolley imagined and described a stately scene in which the richly clothed and bejeweled servants of the king and queen marched into the grave and then were given poison to drink to kill them in place. Off they went to a better place than their drab existences would otherwise warrant, said Woolley. The evidence for this theory came from the cups which the servants still held. He also imagined that other servants came down to slaughter the animals accompanying them. Woolley, unfortunately, was not able to save all the skeletal material that he excavated. But he did save a few bones and skulls, which were re-examined by the University of Pennsylvania Museum starting in 2007. With modern CT scans made then and results published in 2011, it was determined that these attendants were actually killed by blunt force trauma inflicted by a sharp pointed weapon to the back of the head. The attendants were brutally dispatched to their deaths. The cups the people held then didn't contain a poison that killed them. They were most probably the symbol of a ritual banquet, much like the one illustrated on the standard of Ur that we saw in the last lecture. In fact, the remains of many oxen 
used as beasts of burden and meant to pull the carts of the deceased, were also found in that death pit. The implication for the meaning of the burials at the Royal Cemetery at Ur then, from more recent forensic work, is that a great deal of time and trouble went into preparing the royalty, or possibly priests and priestesses, for burial. This includes, these preparations, killing dozens or hundreds of attendants and preparing their bodies by treating them with heat, that is, baking them until they were black and crispy, and then coating them with red cinnabar. The cinnabar preparation was also done by the Chinese and the Maya. Cinnabar was red and therefore used in rituals as if to recall blood. It was also highly toxic and thus helped preserve the bodies. Burial rites included the killing of the service animals too for the feasts and transportation in the underworld. And we see this sort of thing at Teotihuacan in Egypt and many other elite burials around the world. In fact, in today's funeral rituals for presidents and royals, we still see protracted preparations, finely dressed corpses, elaborate processions, including traditional horse-drawn carriages, rites at the grave, and sometimes military salutes. These are the modern descendants of the more grisly rites we see at Ur. But let's focus back on the goats. The two goats, were typical Mesopotamian composite sculptures, ones composed of different colorful and very opulent materials. We saw such composite sculptures in the lectures on the standard of Ur and the Uruk head. But what exactly had Wooly found? When he first laid eyes on the crushed form in the soil, Wooly realized he had to save the original shape but the decomposed core of wood made that a challenge. He and his colleagues at the excavation used wax to hold the many parts they recovered together as they lifted them gingerly out of the soil. It turned out they had myriad pieces of shell, lapis lazuli, gold, silver, copper, and red limestone. All were glued on or fused together with the sticky bitumen or pitch. The mosaic technique used was rather similar to the standard of Ur, but much more difficult to execute since the figure was effectively a standing sculpture in the round. The ram in a thicket was actually part of a sort of furniture. It's thought to have been a support for an offering table or a delicate stand. It might be something similar to what can be seen here in the cylinder seal impression which dates roughly to the same time. Sumerian art always consisted of what we would consider usable or functional objects. They really didn't have art for art's sake in this ancient time, yet they produced something we marvel at today. This piece is particularly complex, laden with symbolism, but also useful and functional. But what exactly do we see? Let's dig down a bit. Wooly thought that the animal he had uncovered was reminiscent of a scene in the Bible. It called to mind for him this passage from Genesis 22:13, in which God orders Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. However, at the last moment, and I quote, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. While biblical allusions were popular at the time, this wasn't exactly an accurate description of the object that Wooly found. It was, in fact, a goat rather than a ram. Sheep and goats are actually rather similar species, and it's hard to tell them apart in the archaeological record. Sheep and goats were among the earliest animals to be domesticated in the ancient Near East, probably as early as 10,000 BC. 
They were the foundation of the flocks that provided sustenance to the people of an arid and harsh land. Not only did they supply meat, but sheep and goats also gave you milk, cheese, wool, fleecy garments, leather, and even horn and bone that could be fashioned into tools. These animals were the very basis of civilization. Herders and farmers and even hunters created the wealth of the land with their work. But there are also wild sheep and goats that existed before domestication and continued to roam the mountains in the ancient Near East. They were the progenitors of the flocks, the stock from which caprids, goats, were domesticated. Charles Darwin, in fact, believed that the domestic species were created by the interbreeding of different wild goats, including one like this. The goat from Ur most closely resembles the wild goats. It seems to be most likely a markhor goat, which is a screwhorn goat with a very shaggy coat. The males can have distinctive and large, beautifully twisted horns, and they are known for the fierce fights during courtship. They are the largest known caprid or goat species, technically known as Capra falconeri. Goats, as you can see in this clip, are able to eat by standing up on their hind legs in order to reach the highest leaves on a bush. Markors, particularly males, must do this more often in the wild. This position is also the one used for mating, and this type of goat seemed to have associations or symbolism related to its virility, like the bull. You can see that the position of the royal cemetery goat is exactly like this. So the artists and people of Sumer were keen observers of animal behavior and represented animals quite accurately. Each goat from Ur stands on its own decorated base that was covered in silver. It stands on hind legs and rests its forelegs on the branches of a gold-clad plant, one which is clearly not related to any in nature. The underbelly of the goat is quite corroded on one example, while the other had gold male genitalia. The hind legs and forelegs of the goat were covered in gold, as was the face. The horns, beard, eyes, and the heavy mane, which is characteristic of a male, they were carved from lapis lazuli. The ears are copper. The fleece on the rest of the body was made of individual white shell pieces carved with these long lines delineating the hairs. This was undoubtedly a representation of an impressive male markhor goat, probably from a colder and mountainous realm. And it's not the only one. Another similar marker goat depiction appears in Queen Puabi's grave at Ur. That woolly caprid is shown as a victim of a lion attack on a small cosmetic box. The goat is upside down this time. The lion's predatory behavior is well observed by the Sumerian artist. This lion pounces on the neck of the downed goat, holding its windpipe until the prey suffocates. The box is made from some of the same precious materials as the Ur rearing goat, carved shell and lapis lazuli. It's safe to assume that these materials trade goods from places as far away as Afghanistan were meant to indicate both the wealth of the owner and perhaps the sanctity of the subject. The theme of forces of nature in conflict is a major one in the ancient art of Mesopotamia, which is why you see many renditions of this theme. The defeat of chaos by order, in fact, is a major duty and power of a ruler. Going back to this composite sculpture, though, we can see 
another theme emerging, one which is a little different. It's the theme of the fertility of the land. You'll remember that in a land like Sumer, in which water is scarce, producing food was of paramount importance. That emphasis on foodstuffs and fertility is something we just saw represented by the procession depicted on the standard of Ur and also on the Uruk vase. If you look once again at the standard, you can even see a screwhorn goat, a marker, in the second row on the peace side. It's part of the procession leading some other fleecy caprons. The screwhorn goat is differentiated from the others whose horns are curved. How do we know that fertility is the theme of this object depicting a goat? We have a clue, in fact, a number of clues. The most important one is the plant itself. As I mentioned before, this is not a realistic plant. A central trunk or stem is not very plant-like, and it is topped by a single leaf. All of it is covered in gold foil. The trunk also has two gold branches, and from these emerge more leaves and a very stylized rosette. This rosette is the symbol of the goddess Inanna, goddess of fertility, and the main subject of the Uruk vase. So, the goat is standing on his hind legs in order to nibble at the branches bearing the rosette symbol of Inanna. The goat represents the male force, virile and wild perhaps. He represents the fauna of the land as well. The plant is the symbol of the female, the goddess and plant world, and the central leaf may be a bud or fruit. Some scholars have even gone a step further in decoding the deep symbolism of this arresting object. They see the goat as not just nibbling the plant, but actually engaging in a form of sexual union with the plant, the symbol of the goddess Inanna. This is supported by the explicitly male genitalia that survived on one of the goats from Ur. If this is true, we have the union of male and female, which represents the fecundity of the earth. We also have the union of flora and fauna, which symbolizes the riches of the earth as well, on another level. This would imply that the object is a sacred piece of temple furniture, one which embodies the most basic concerns of the Sumerians in their quest to survive in a harsh land. There is additional evidence supporting the fertility symbolism shown here. We already have learned that the role of the Sumerian king was a dual one. The standard of Ur shows the ruler as leader in warfare. Conflict most often arose over scarce resources. We even have texts from this era which record fierce battles between city-states concerning water rights. But the other role of the Sumerian king was as mediator to the gods. He was expected to provide for his people, to ensure the fertility of the earth by interceding with the gods, most importantly with Inanna. That's why the theme of the sacred marriage is one which keeps recurring, both in art and in text. The ruler was really the pater familias, in a sense. His legitimacy stemmed from his success in importuning the gods to provide crops and meat for his populace. In fact, we know from slightly later Mesopotamian literature that there are three main themes or cult dramas. These were first perceived by the great scholar Torkild Jakobsen. He saw Mesopotamians most concerned with the sacred marriage, which ensures regeneration and fertility of the land, the change of seasons, which marks a loss of fertility, 
much like we see later in the Greek myth of Persephone going to the underworld. And three, the primeval battle between the forces of chaos and order. These concerns are reflected in the role of the ruler, just as we saw it on the standard of Ur. The theme of fertility and union is seen here in the goat stand, which probably was part of the temple furniture. We see battles between gods and men, or wild and domestic animals, on the cylinder seals of the time. We saw that theme in the cosmetic box from Ur, too. Conflict. One of the most beautiful and interesting seals provides us with more information about the role of the ruler and Inanna. It dates to earlier, to the time of the Uruk period and the Uruk vase, but it bears a scene which relates to the ram in a thicket. On the modern impression, you can see a central figure. He is a bearded man in a net skirt. He wears the hat or cap, which we know symbolized rulership. The net skirt is another indication of his status as ruler. He holds two branches with flowers that are exactly like the rosettes nibbled on by the Ur goat. These branches and rosettes are a symbol of the goddess Inanna and of the female creative force. Another symbol of Inanna is also repeated here. Do you see the curving gateposts with streamers? They indicated the temple or symbol of Inanna and inform us that this is a sacred scene. We saw those streamers already on the Uruk vase. In fact, we see vases that are shaped just like the Uruk vase itself on this seal. The seal is chipped in several places, so don't draw any conclusions from the chipped areas. Now, note that above the Uruk-shaped vases is a young animal, perhaps a calf. The two central larger animals on either side of the ruler figure rear up to nibble on the branches and the rosettes. The ruler is feeding them. These animals seem to be male, and they're usually identified as bulls. It seems possible to me, however, that their twisted horns indicate something else. It's possible that these are screw-horned goats, representing the male principle. They are nibbling on the female principle, as represented by the rosettes of Inanna. The ruler, or lord, in his religious function, feeds the animals. He is central to the scene of regeneration and fecundity. Some scholars even believe that the ruler was meant to represent the consort of Inanna, Dumuzi. Dumuzi was a vegetation god who died and was reborn each spring season. We also know him as Tammuz, and we see something similar with the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who has her lover Adonis die in a similar scenario. These fertility and regeneration gods explain and symbolize the cyclicality of the seasons. Placing the ruler at the center of this process legitimizes his rule and commands respect from his populace. Power can be expressed through these visual symbols of Inanna, the animals, the plants, and the ruler. The seal itself was probably used by an official of the temple and was powerful for its symbolic imagery and the message it conveyed. It was also most likely used as a talisman with magical properties related to its symbolic content or the stone that it was made of. It is the object which is most symbolically linked with the Ur goat. They both express the principle of fecundity and regeneration. One small detail that also adds to the plot, the so-called ram caught in a thicket was tied to his golden plant by a silver chain. The silver 
was badly corroded, so it no longer is shown. The rosette floral motif, however, appears again in a spectacular way in the Royal Cemetery of Ur. I'll show you the fantastic jewelry and gold headdress worn by the Queen Puabi. Her body was the one with the most extravagant ornamentation in the Royal Cemetery. The queen was accompanied by numerous sacrificed handmaidens who wore similar but simpler headdresses. You can see in this reconstruction of the placement of elements that this was one very rich and complex headgear. Most likely, Sumerian women wore ornate braids or wigs that could be used to support the elaborate jewelry. The elements consisted of many feet of gold ribbon wrapped around the coiffure. Over these were laid hair rings and several wreaths of different kinds of gold leaves, like these. The theme of vegetation and flora is associated with these women. You can see that there are rosettes made of gold on the head comb that surmounts her hair. There's also a wreath of rosettes below that, and it is made of lapis, carnelian, and gold. The rich colors and materials are striking. You can see that the queen, loaded with such valuable and highly wrought adornments, occupied a central place in the burial and most likely the religious life of Ur. But they are much more than a signifier of wealth and abundance. We now know from the rosettes that most likely the queen and the many accoutrements of the tomb had a complex and abiding symbolism, which was centered on the most basic concerns of people who lived at this time and in this place. They wrapped their anxiety about survival and their concern with fertility of the land in a golden web of artistic brilliance. Yet all these objects were so much more. They were indicative of a highly worked out symbolic system, a religion based on the duality of nature gods, and the centrality of the ruler in all this symbolism of sustenance. The jewelry and other objects also had symbolism that was concerned with death and funerary rites. In fact, the Sumerian story of Inanna's descent to the underworld describes in touching detail how Inanna must give up each of her sumptuous jewels in her descent to the underworld, arriving naked. Perhaps the jewels here had an additional meaning. They were meant as offerings to the gods of the underworld. In this manner, the jewelry may have served more than one purpose and had more symbolism than we can even surmise. However complex it seems, the elemental themes of survival and prosperity rooted in nature are ones which echo down the millennia. In the next lecture, we'll look at the temple that stood in the city of Ur, one which Sir Leonard Woolley also excavated. It dates to a few hundred years after the Royal Cemetery, but we will still see themes of kingship, worship, the creation of the city, and its social and religious fabric, all through unusual architecture. We shall look at the ziggurat of Ur.